Turn with me in our Bibles to Genesis. Fourth chapter, 16th verse. As you're looking in Genesis, fourth chapter, 16th verse. I'd like to encourage those that give your heart to Christ if you want to be baptized. As I said, this coming Wednesday is a beautiful time on Ash Wednesday to make that sacrifice to let the world know <laughs> that you've passed from death unto life. But this morning we're going to cover the generations of Adam and how quickly they began to descend into darkness. It was a very corrupt society. Man tells us that uh, we were born and we didn't know very much and we evolved into the great creation we are today. The Bible tells us we begin with a greater blessing and slowly we've descended to the place we are today. Now what you're going to find about Adam's children, especially through Cain, when they left Adam and Cain was driven away and he went to the land of Nod, meaning the place of wandering, from the presence of the Lord. That's what it says here in the 16th verse. And Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land of wandering, or Nod, on the east of Eden. Now, I've never found anyone that knew where that was, but how many knows when you leave God, you begin to just wander around in darkness, searching for something, searching for a peace that you can't find. Now, we can meet individuals that have about as much money as a human being could want in this life, as much fame as you could want in this life, much popularity as you want in this life, and they're not happy. How many has ever had a dream to achieve and have something, and when you went for that dream and it arrived, you still weren't happy? There's an emptiness inside. I have found that when I found Jesus Christ, it didn't matter how much money I had in the bank, it didn't matter what uh, dwellings that I was living in, it didn't matter what my clothing were, or my social standing in society was, when I found Jesus, I found peace. It passeth understanding. See, we're trying to comprehend why we're at peace with our mind. How many has ever went a trial in your life and you had peace and you couldn't explain to anybody why you were so happy? You're not happy for the trial. You're not happy for the adversity. You're not happy for the sickness. You're not happy for the loss of a loved one, but you're happy that God is always with you and you're in the presence of God. And when you go home, you can read from the 16th verse down to the 23rd verse, and I'll not quote all that or read all of it. But the children of Cain became a godless society. They built cities. They were prosperous. They loved music. And we have learned the last few that have taught and and preached here for us that Satan, no doubt, most believe that he was almost the leader of the music in heaven. Music can either lift you up or music can cause you to become corrupt. Seems that somehow moves on the very soul of man. Remember David when he came to the king and he was troubled, he would get the harp and begin to play and the spirit, evil spirit would leave uh, the king. Music can bring smoothing, but music somehow enters into our soul. That's why we have to be very careful what we listen to. In the musical end, what we read at home, I'm not one of these, believe you can't read books, you can read books. I'm not one of those that believe you can't have a television. But I do know that uh, it used to be a knob on the TV. Now God made something for men we carry around with us uh, and we can turn it off. Every once in a while I let my wife have the remote, but I treasure it dearly. How many of you men learned you're the head of the house and the remote is yours? So basically, 1,500 years, the world had become corrupt. They were more educated than ever before. They had beautiful cities. They had iron. They had steel. They had beautiful things of gold and silver. Everything that man could want. But God. 
the saddest individual in the world. Jesus spoke it and it always haunts my mind when he said, I'll die and you'll die in your sins and where I am you cannot come. Not to have the presence of God when the storms of life are raging is the saddest thing that can happen to anyone. To die without the presence of God is the darkest moment on earth. Going through sickness and going through death is not easy. But when I walk through the valleys of the shadow of death with my God, you can have peace. You can have hope. You can raise your hands and say, Lord, here I am. No matter how weak the body, no matter what leukemia or cancer has done, you're with me, you'll always be with me. And if you do not heal me in this land, I know I'll be healed in the next. I'm going to be in the presence of God. Now let me rephrase that. I'm already in the presence of God on earth. I'm just going to be with Him forever. 25th verse of the 4th chapter. In the midst of the darkness of the children of Cain, of their sin and iniquity. And Adam knew his wife again, and she bare a son and called his name Seth. For God said she, hath appointed me another seed instead of Abel whom Cain slew. And to Seth, to him also there was born a son, and he called his name Enos. That's when men begin to call upon the name of the Lord. <laughs> no matter how dark it is, no matter how corrupt it is, no matter how bad it seems, God seems to always send a remnant of those that believe in Him that will call upon His name and give hope to the world. Now, I find in this age that we live in, we're in a land of democracy, which means the majority rules. Understand something about God. It's theocracy. The majority doesn't rule with God. God rules, and you listen. <laughs> now, as far as the world goes, they think the ways of God are old-fashioned and foolish. And if you're not careful, it will corrupt the minds of the church. That we think we're supposed to appease the world with our life, life that we live and moralities and everything that we have. That's not so. But there's never been a generation and never will be until the church is caught out of here and there seems to be revival after that that there will not be men that will worship or call upon God. Now the terminology here in the original Greek when it was translated all over from the Hebrew was they learn to gather together and worship God. Now what are we doing this morning? We're assembling ourselves together to worship God. We do it through song. We do it through testimony. We do it in the classes downstairs, the classes outside for the teens and the preteens and for the adults here in the auditorium. We're here to praise and glorify God, the creator of the world, and His Son, Jesus Christ. Whatever we do in God's house, and there's many things that we do, we have weddings, we have singings, we, we have times that we gather together for other functions. Uh, but everything should be preeminent uh, to lift up the name of our Father and His Son, Jesus Christ. Uh, and if it does not worship God, it should not be done in the house of God. Fifth verse. This is the book of the generations of Adam in the day that God created man, the likeness of God made he man. We can go on and on and on in the third verse. You know what I always in my mind, my mind doesn't work like most folks somehow. My wife keeps telling me that. <laughs> they call it the genealogies of Adam. I call it the cemetery, the first cemetery in the world. Adam begot so-and-so and he died. And he begot so-and-so and he, say it with me, died. So you find that fifth chapter and the sixth chapter is nothing but a place of cemeteries. They begin to bury him because they sinned against God. He said they would die. 
so they begin to bury him. Now, it's very important to understand this. People that lose their children will come to me and say, why would God take someone that in that's innocent? I mean, knows a child's innocent. They're born in sin because they're sent around about us, but a child hasn't sinned. They're not old enough to sin. They don't know about sin. And comprehend something else. Before the flood, there was no law. So you can't say so much they broke the law because there was no law. He didn't go to tell uh, Cain that he broke the law. He told him he, that he had killed his brother. And he went from the presence of God. But he did tell Adam, you will die. Therefore, until Christ comes back for the church and we go to heaven, we will bury our loved ones. And it's not always because of something you've done. You can shorten your days by your choices in the life and the things that you do. So let's mark that down. I'm not here to be uh, ignorant of that fact. How many knows you can shorten? The Bible talked about those that shorten their days. And you can by being obedient unto your parents uh, and those that's over you in the Lord and the lifestyle that you choose and things you do. You can add to your life on earth. It's not always God that adds to you and takes away. It's you that makes the choice. Now God has the final decision in it, uh, but He'll take away. But children will die. Not because of me or them or their parents, but because of Adam and Eve, uh, the federal head of man, death will come. Through one man, death came to all in a singular sense, and by one man, Jesus Christ, life comes to all. So all of a sudden we find that uh, when the cemetery here, and we find that men died, but, but what I like about here in this chapter, there was four that impacted our life. Seth, when men begin to call upon the Lord, and the seventh from Adam, Enoch. Turn with me to Hebrews 11 chapter. I believe it's the fifth verse. Remember how we've been teaching in generations and we follow the verses of Hebrews? You notice how the chapters of Genesis falls in with the chapter or the verses of Hebrews? Third chapter for the first word in the first chapter. Eleventh chapter of Hebrews, third verse. The first chapter of Genesis in the beginning, God, he said, through faith we understand that the worlds which were framed by the word of God, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. Creation. Then when we come to the next chapters, by faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. Now to the fifth verse. By faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him, and before this, and before his translation, he had his, this testimony that he pleased God. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. And then he talked about Noah next. Now, once Enoch was 60 years of age, he had a son and called him Methuselah. After that time, he began to walk in the presence or walk with God. Only two men in the Bible are ever quoted as saying walked with God. Enoch and Noah. Others had been in the presence of God, had seen the hinder part of God, but only these two ever walked after the fall of man with God in a certain relationship. He seems to be an example from the old Bible of the church. How many is walking according to the laws of God? And before the flood of wrath comes, I'm going to be out of here. He was caught up. Enoch walked with God and then he was not. I like what I read in one of the uh, uh, teaching lessons that I was studying on. And a little kid went home to tell his parents, said, guess what happened today? They said, what? He said, we learned about Enoch. And his dad said, who's Enoch? And he said, well, I'll tell you who he is. He said, he was a man that God would come by every morning and he would get his bagel and his coffee and go for a walk with God. <laughs> so they did it every morning for years. And finally, Enoch knew when God was coming at 8 o'clock, would have his two bagels and two coffees and meet him at the gate and then walk together. Now, this is in the mind of a child. He said, one day, you know how I get my friends and I walk and I don't come home on time? Enoch and God just went for a long, 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 long walk. Ate their bagels, drank their coffee, 
sat under the tree and just kept walking. And finally God looked at Enoch and said, you know what? We're closer to my house than yours. Why don't you just come live with me? And Enoch went and lived with him and moved to a new home. That was from the mouth and wisdom of a six-year-old. We go to college. We take uh, classes of theology. In time we're done, we're so mixed up. We don't know uh, that when we walk with God, He loves us so much. One day we just move and be with Him in His house, in His home, with Him forever and ever and ever. The Lord Himself shall descend from heaven with a shout and the voice of the archangel, the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first, and we that are alive and remain shall be caught up to be with the clouds forevermore. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Enoch is a message unto me that one day I'm leaving here and I'm going to move in with God. That's Enoch also in Jews said, Enoch also the seventh Adam prophesied of this that said, Behold, the day come uh, that the, uh, the angels will come with him and would execute judgment on those that were wicked and ungodly in this world. He prophesied of a judgment coming, uh, but he knew that he was going to be raptured out before it took place. How many knows the world laughs at the doctrine of being raptured, of being caught out? They make fun of it. Oh, they can make bombs to blow each other up with. They can build missiles and, and satellites to do all kinds of good things and bad things. Uh, uh, but they just can't comprehend that one day God's going to show up and I'm leaving with God. Now in the New Testament when you walk with God it means by the manner of your life. It's not quite the terminology used here for Enoch. But neighbor Enoch lived for God in the midst of a very perverted world. Well, Brother Robert you don't understand you don't work where I work. Enoch lived where you lived. In the sixth chapter, God repented man because every imagination of his heart was evil and wicked. The seventh from Adam was Lamishi, and he was a gentleman that started to polygamy, and he always said, he stood up and said, if God didn't destroy uh, our father Cain for his sins, he'll not destroy me because I slayed a man also, but he, he tried to harm me, and I killed him. His blood's on my hands, but you'll be suffering if you bother me for it. It became such a wicked world that God sent a flood and destroyed man. How I many knows we live in a wicked world today? The, the, the knowledge of man has increased greatly. What man can do with, 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 I can get on an airplane and be in California in just a few hours. Uh, uh, the, 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 the technology that we have is just mind-boggling. Uh, but God still judges us uh, by our moral issue and by our heart uh, and by our soul. Uh, he doesn't judge us by how much we know uh, uh, about the intellect of this world. Uh, he judges us uh, by the attitude we have to His world. Uh, and He said, as Enoch was faithful, uh, how faithful we are to God. Uh, for you must believe there, that God is God. Uh, because without faith you cannot please God. Impossible. No matter what we do, if we do not have faith and believe in God, it will not be pleasing to Him. How many wants to please God? Believe that He is a rewarder of those that ask Him. Most churches, you don't have to go to the world does not really believe God will answer your prayers today. The majority of those that claim to be Christians do not believe in divine healing. Let me see the hands of you that know that God touched your body in a way that only God could have done it. Well, maybe somebody can't say, why don't if you're, can you stand on your feet? Now, it's not a knock against medical science. You know I encourage and I praise God for the doctors and the, and the caregivers and the medicine and things that makes it easy in life. But there come a time in my life and my wife's life, even doctors said we could do nothing and God healed. Now let me see you stand so, so we can get a good view of those that know. We, we don't have to quote it. Uh, we don't have to guess at it. You know that God healed you. Kenny, now the cancer left his colon into in, in his 
uh, 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 kidneys, wasn't it? Uh, liver. And once, once uh, cancer leaves, they call into the liver. Most of you know that it's just a matter of time. You just don't recover from that. Uh, doctors knew the treatment wouldn't work. Uh, so we look around about a half the church or more than half the church. Uh, you know that you know uh, that God uh, answers prayers. Uh, without faith, it's impossible to please God. Uh, you must believe that He is, uh, and He is a rewarder of those that diligently seek Him. Uh, give Him a hand clap. Uh, you that are standing, uh, you are to praise Him uh, because He will be with you. Uh, he'll touch you and leave you, off, leave you through all the storms of life. <laughs> you may be seated. Some of you, your wide membership ran out and I just want to get you up and down for exercise reasons. <laughs> Methuselah lived, what, 969 years? I might quote, misquote it a few days. From Adam to the flood, Adam and Methuselah covered the whole time. He died the year of the flood, Methuselah. His name means, in most translations, they have two or three different names, but the one that most hold to, he will not be here when it takes place. He left before the flood. Brother McKee, I want you to put it on my forehead. He'll not be here when it takes place. Now some folks have asked me, and I'm not here to cause problems. They said, Pastor Roberts, uh, we don't believe, uh, as you do, that the church is raptured out before tribulation. I'm not going to debate with you. You can be saved if you want to wait around halfway through the tribulation. If you want to wait till the end of it, I'm not going to debate. I'm not going to argue. I believe I'm leaving. Hmm? I believe there will be battles with the Antichrist. His spirit's already in the world. I believe the church will be persecuted. But I do not believe the wrath of God will be poured upon the children of God. And I believe I'll be counted worthy to escape the wrath that's coming upon the world of the ungodly. I believe I'm going to leave here. And I believe the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout. Uh, and the trump of God. Uh, how many is ready to go? You'll not find one thing in the Bible that has to take place for the rapture of the church. Uh, maybe for the coming uh, uh, of the Antichrist and these things. Uh, but for the rapture of the church, uh, it may happen tonight. Now let's try that again. <laughs> Jesus may come tonight. <laughs> again, I, I don't usually say much about those on TV or uh, et cetera. They, bring, they do a service for those that shut in. They, they bring encouragement to people. But there's so many that teach us that he can't come back until the church gets ready. Find it in your Bible for me and I'll believe it. He's coming back. And if you're not ready, you get to stay. <laughs> and if you're ready, you go. It's real simple. He's coming back for those that are looking. Those that are ready. And be you all so ready for in the hour that you think not, the Son of Man will return. No, I have a dream. Now, God's not going to do it my way, but I'd like to be in the pulpit. I love to be preaching. I, I love to do one of my little hillbilly jumps uh, and the, the trumpet sounds, and I won't come back down. I'll just keep going. <laughs> Set with me. Even so, come quickly. Jesus is coming back. Those that believe this purify themselves even as he is pure. When the doctrine of the rapture of the church is taken out of the church, the church begins to live in peer. Let me ask you. If an angel appeared this morning and walked down the aisle and say tonight at 12 o'clock, You'll die. Now, I know a lot of us quote ministers say, I'm going to live like I've always lived. How many of you are going to be like me? You're going to take inventory. <laughs> we should live like, okay, God, you can come at 4 o'clock. But how many is the first thing you're going to do? Now, you're going to call your family and let them know and et cetera. But how many of you are going to be like your pastor? Lord, search me. And if there's anything wrong, let's get it out of here. I'm leaving tonight to meet God. But how many knows we should live as if this moment 
The Bible does not say today. He said now is a day of salvation. He never told you you had a day. He never told you you had 24 hours. He never told you you had 12 hours. Right now I minister. My uh, mother-in-law, her second husband was a wonderful man. Her first husband was a wonderful man. Her third husband's a wonderful man. Her second husband in church in the back pew had a heart attack and died instantly. I, I know a lot of folks that died in the podium. Uh, the gentleman that wrote uh, uh, the song, Ain't No Grave Gonna Hold My Body Down, Claude Ely, he officiated the wedding of my uh, brother there in, 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 in Virginia. Uh, he died in the pulpit, preaching, uh, slumped down, and went to be with God. I, I heard somebody say, well, you know, if he's really living for God, it wouldn't happen that way. What nonsense can you talk about? Uh, neighbor, I'd rather die preaching in the pulpit uh, than anywhere I know. Uh, I'd rather be preaching here than in a nursing home uh, or along a highway uh, or drowning in a lake or burning up in a cabin. Uh, I'd rather be jumping up and down uh, and God reaches and say, come on home, son. Leap a little higher. Uh, I was here, but now I'm not. I've gone to be with him. Jesus is coming back. We need to be ready every moment we live. The first thing in the morning we need to pray, Lord, you may come today. I want to be ready to go be with you. Yeah. He walked with God. I'll close here. I can go for a long time. And he pleased God. You know my... In our biggest trouble, we try to please. How many of us watch what we think and say, we didn't want to hurt this one or that one? Go easy. There's only one you better please when you enter into this building. <laughs> He's the one that holds your soul. The greatest blessing I could give to Kenny Osborne is to be honest and have his soul ready for eternity. I cannot give you a better thing. The greatest sermon I could preach to you is to be ready. He may come. Not in the rapture. He may take you out today. And if you're ready when you leave here, he that wins souls shall be wise and shine as the firmament forever and ever and ever. Now, I don't believe there's a big guy and a little you in heaven, but I'm going to tell you something. The one that encouraged me to pray and was instrumental in my salvation. When I get to heaven, I'm going to look up God the Father first and the Son and, and thank them and the Holy Spirit. I'll probably skip the angels and find that minister or that person that prayed me and thank them and say, thank you that you led me to God. This is mine now forever and ever and ever. Woo, how many knows you get certain rewards in heaven that are the greatest rewards you can have and winning souls is the greatest thing you can ever Ever do for God on earth and people in heaven. I would to God that everyone that has a physical, financial, or whatever problem that it was, I could pray and it disappear. But if I had to choose, I'd take your soul. Because we're going to die someday anyway. So, so why add a few more years? That's the greatest gift. It's not. I have. Let me close. I'm trying to close, but when we get on where I'm going, my home. You know, I'm not one of these that believe that having things is sin. If one of you won the lottery and had $250 million in your lottery and you come by and say, Pastor, I'm going to buy you a new $2 million home. We're going to put it right there on Laguna Beach where it's this perfect weather. <laughs> you watch this. No, I might want it here in Asheville. It doesn't matter. Where. I'm going to call my kids up and say, Hey, come look at my house. I mean, you want to call your friends and say, hey, come take a tour. Yeah. Not, not being conceited, not think I'm better than them, but how many of you are just going to say, oh, I got a new home, it don't matter. Yeah. Yeah. Hope nobody sees it. Oh, goodness gracious. Put mine on top of a hill and let it glow. <laughs> are you proud? How many is glad for what God does for you? Yeah. How many is glad for what God gives you? Do you hide it under a bushel? You never think you're better than anyone else. You never think you're greater than anyone else. But I'm here to tell you, I want to tell the world that God has saved me. He's redeemed me. He's healed me. He's filled me with the Holy Spirit. He's blessed me. He's been with me. I've walked with Him. He's walked with me. I feel His presence. And I'm here to tell you, it's the greatest life you can ever have. I'll get my amen up here. If I don't get it out of you, I'll just charge them in.
Now I'm going to close. You notice how the chapter of faith ties in with every chapter in the starting of Genesis. Without faith, you won't believe there's a God. And you go by theories and supposition that you came from a monkey or a little cell somewhere. Now some folks act like they came from somewhere. Till we get saved, we do act kind of, you know, like we need help. But now we are the children of God. Woo! And then when I bring my sacrifice, it's by faith I bring it to Him. He accepts me. He blesses our generations of our children and grandchildren that follow Him. And it shall be written. He walked with God in the presence of God. And his son will be the oldest man on earth recorded. And will put on his forehead. He shall not leave. He shall leave before these things come. Wow. I, like to, I just like to put that right across to you. So everybody asks me what it means. I'm out of here. Woo, when the sun turned black as set across the hair. Brother Showalter, I'm gone. <laughs> Hallelujah. I'm not going to argue with you if you believe mid-trib or you live post. As long as you accept the blood of Christ, you're saved and you're cleansing the blood. That's fine. But I'm telling you, I read the Bible. I believe I'm leaving here on the first train, the first trumpet. I'm out of here. I got my ears tuned up for the sound of the trumpet. When I wake up in the morning, oh, I just, I just like to hear that in my soul. All of a sudden, I'm gone. Let's stand. What the world needs more than anything is people that worship God and walks in the presence of God so they can have hope. No matter how rich they may be, no matter how successful they may be, without God, there's no hope. If you won the lottery and gave me the new home, and I sat down in a two and a half, three million dollar home with a brand new $200,000 automobile in the garage. You'll wheel me down this aisle and I'll die and leave it. So put it in its place. But what I got in my heart today, the presence of God, I will never, never lose it. The grave can't take it from me. And when the angel walks in and whispers, it's not the angel of death for me, it's the angel of life shows up and says, come home. (laughs) I'm leaving. I'm saying, goodbye world, hello Jesus. Me and Jesus is going to get a bagel. I don't like bagels good, but if he's with me, I'll eat them. She does. God bless you. Don't take me out for bagels. I'll try to eat them. My son-in-law loves bagels. And he'll buy them when I'm with him. I'll wait for the biscuits. (laughs) Or the toast come by. But if Jesus is there, a bagel will taste good. And I'm going to get so close to him, like that little girl said, I'm not coming back. I'm going to stay. How many is like me? You just want to have him every day with you, feel his presence, and one day you wake up. How many has ever been with that good mother of yours, that grandmother, that good aunt that's a Christian? And just when they're leaving, they'll whisper, "I, I, I see you. Can you see I've said so many. Maybe I've said with so many. I've heard them say, so and so is coming back. Can you see them, Reverend? No, I don't see them, but I feel something inside. And you can just see them glaze. They don't see you standing there anymore. They look past you and see the one that's walked with them through life. And they go on home to be with them. Whoo, that's not dying, isn't it? That's just graduating to a better world. Father God, I close my head and we come to you in thanks that you've always sent a set. You've always sent an Enoch. You've always sent someone in the midst of a perverse generation, a crooked world, a sinful world, and give us hope. And you always will. It's your grace. It's your love. And you sent one greater than Enoch. You sent Jesus, the Son of God. And if we have faith with him, where two or three is gathered together, he's in the midst. His presence of his Holy Spirit is here to encourage, to strengthen. If there be one lost this morning, Father God, that you'll speak to their heart and let them know they can have hope beyond this world. No matter what trauma is taking place in their life, what tragedy, what turmoil, even if everything's going good, 
let them know they need the hope of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. While men or women are praying, is there one hand would go up? You all look like Christians to me, so I'm not here to judge. That you need salvation. You need that hope that only God can give. You need the presence of the Lord when you walk through the valleys of the shadow of death. So I'm taking all of us as Christians. If not, you can still pray. You don't have to raise your hand to be saved. You can pray at your seat. But can we take a moment and thank God that He'll walk with us, that He'll be with us. And one day, He'll say, Brother, come home with me. Woo! <laughs> Hallelujah. 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 Begin to search your heart and say, Lord, make me ready and come quickly. Come quickly. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, Father God, speak to our hearts the importance of coming back for your people. Jesus. While she's playing or singing, search your soul. Say, God, take inventory. If I leave tonight, I want everything ready. I want everything under the blood. Hallelujah.